Hi, Professor Roundtree here again, Marketing 3401. Uh, finishing up part two of chapter 12, where we're talking about uh, channels and, and how that fits into our overall strategy to deliver value. And I think we left off on the concept of disintermediation. And now we're gonna step into a discussion related to how do we design a channel? What are some of the decisions that have to be made in terms of what's important that will help us understand how we should most effectively shape a channel. And we're gonna talk about it from these four standpoints to, to start out. How do we relate more so to what consumers are looking at? Um, what type of objectives do we have for the channel itself? What are some of the alternatives we have and how do we identify them? And then finally, how do we evaluate them, compare and contrast across different ways to structure the channel? So remember, there's not always one single way to structure and design a channel. So the first one, it, it kind of goes back to what we always talk about is a foundational concept, a group of concepts that revolve around trying to understand what consumer needs are. I mean, we mostly, not mostly, but we do oftentimes talk about um, analyzing and, and, and trying to dissect consumer needs when it comes to creating the physical product or service. But now we have to ask the question, how can we create a channel that's best suited for the people who we're trying to target? So again, it goes back to the basic concepts of segmentation. Who are we actually trying to, to serve? And if it's multiple segments, we may have to figure out how to make the channel itself universal or if they're very distinct maybe there are a couple of different ways that we can actually create it so for example if we have very very high involvement kind of products stuff we talked about before people who really have a high need for information they're very analytical um, maybe having an option in terms of a channel where they can buy stuff online where you can provide almost unlimited information that they can have at their disposal so they can actually make their decisions if we're talking about younger buyers, uh, you may want to create a channel that might have the potential to be very interesting, enjoyable, upbeat. Uh, maybe being in the mall might make more sense for a young buyer, if we're talking about, for example, apparel, than to have it as a standalone store, or maybe somewhere in a strip mall. So again, it's really about understanding you know, what it is that might appeal to our consumer. And then the, at the end of the day, too, we have to consider that as it relates to the cost. So um, whatever channel is going to help us control our costs. But foremost, though, first and foremost, we should have to create something that's going to be beneficial to the people we're trying to sell to. Next, we have to think about the, the, the level of customer service that we might want to have in that particular channel. Again, goes back to who the segment is. And so you need to have a customer service component that is reflective of the needs of the target market. So again, high information people, people who are highly involved, it needs to be structured where it can maximize the potential for them to use as much information as they possibly can. So, and also too, sometimes interacting with very knowledgeable people might be very important asking your questions, getting them answered. Many high involvement people will do a lot of research before they walk into a retail environment. And then they'll go in and they'll have more of a discussion uh, rather than just seeking out information from uh, someone who is trying to sell to them. So the physical environment will always, 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 always be important. Uh, so it, again, you have to match that up with the resources and the cost potential um, to, to actually deliver on that. The next step is identifying what are some of the major alternatives. So we, 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 we do some research. It's kind of like me, most of the processes that we talk about. Uh, we do some research, figure out what our options are, and then we have to you know, make some evaluation or make a decision. So in terms of identifying these different alternatives, a lot of it is looking at what is best suited for our consumers. Is it more of a direct type of channel? So there, if it's direct, then we really need to see whether or not we should just have an online exclusive business. If we need a brick and mortar business, what type of brick and mortar business? Is it something that's more suited for a mall? If it is suited for a mall, is it an upscale mall or, or a more traditional mall? 
if it's a higher end brand, then it should be in whatever the the local high end mall that would have the Neiman Marcus and and some and the Nordstroms, for example. And so it should be in a mall like that. Or if it's going to be in a department in a department store, maybe it should be in a department store, something like that. If we're talking about a very high end, uh, very much a, a luxury oriented kind of brand. So. The, the important thing is we have to figure out how do we create the channel that makes it uh, more appealing to our consumers. Uh, Apple made the decision that they really needed to have physical retail stores where they could have maximum control over how their Apple products, their physical products were actually sold, displayed, discussed about. And they wanted to create more of an experiential place, a meeting place where people who are interested in high end technology and especially, you know, Apple based technology could meet and interact with uh, the technicians who are there, but also to other users and, and uh, owners and consumers of their products. Now, most brands have to make a, an initial decision in terms of how they want to distribute their product in terms of what I would call density. Um, so for example, the examples are given here in terms of, you know, if it's intensive distribution, we're talking about some of those low information, uh, impulse buying kinds of products like candy and snack foods and the like. Um, but it has to be a product, when we talk about intensive distribution, we're talking about having it in convenience stores, we have it in traditional um, department stores, supermarkets, anywhere where you would sell food, snacks, or in the case of toothpaste, it could be health and beauty aids. Um, so intensive basically means that you, you pretty much have it anywhere where you can buy it in retail. Conversely, looking at a, a luxury kind of brand, you're going to have more of an exclusive distribution. So if you have a luxury automobile like a Ferrari, not only are you going to have fewer locations than you would have, for example, for a Ford or a Chevrolet, those locations have to be in more affluent areas. That's why you will see them in Bel Air. You'll see them in uh, Beverly Hills, California, maybe some cities that are in, in Florida. Um, more upscale, uh, located very close in proximity to the people who could actually afford it. And then the selective distribution typically will be uh, those types of outlets that sell more specialty kinds of products. So you can, you can find um, great televisions by Samsung, Sony, all the manufacturers you can think of. They sell them in many different types of stores, anywhere from Costco's to specialty, specialty stores like Best Buy. Uh, but the important point here is that um, they are very selective in where they put them. Um, however, you could still find them in what I would call traditional department stores as well. But the selection that you will see in a Sears is going to be very different in terms of breadth than you will see in a Best Buy. And same thing for Costco. You're going to see fewer different models. It's just that they're going to take one or two models for a manufacturer and basically just, you know, bring out all the costs and make it a very cost effective and affordable one uh, for Costco customers to actually purchase. So once you figure out exactly, you know, what it is that you, you want to do in terms of distribution, what's the ideal environment to, again, connect or attract your consumers, the question has to be, what criteria should I apply to see which one makes sense? And it's all going to, always going to be about some economic component. Where can I maximize my margins? And so in a retail context, if you're a manufacturer, your margins are determined by your cost and how much you sell to the retailer in terms of the cost. So for example, we might buy something for $20 at retail. Uh, but the wholesaler may have paid $10 to the manufacturer and it cost the manufacturer $2 to make. So the margins there are only $8. So you may want to figure out where you might have the best margins. But oftentimes having the best margins doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best uh, opportunity for you to sell your product. You look at the quality of, of what they do in terms of displaying your product, being in a physical location that's attractive to the people who you want to draw to your, your product. Um, but also, too, you want to have some control in terms of how your product is displayed. 
Uh, you want to have some control over what other products you want to have seen side by side with yours. And so some of those choices you may have some control over, but the bottom line is if you, you choose a particular retailer, you should have a pretty good idea of what kinds of competitive products they actually sell in your particular category. And you would hope that the, the organizations that you are looking at are going to be more adaptive. So long-term, if we're talking about a long-term commitment, you want a channel member that's very flexible. Uh, not someone that's very rigid. So, for example, you may s decide that uh, you need an opportunity to come in and not only display your product, but to have someone demonstrate it and interact with consumers. So you want somebody who is going to be adaptable where they can allow that to happen versus the rigidity you get with some retailers where they say, basically, here's the shelf space where you can actually display your product. End of story. Similar to what we were talking about before in terms of international channels, you have to, to think about all the differences between doing business in the United States and doing businesses not only across the water in, in international uh, countries, but there are various nuances that you will see in selling products in Europe. And even within Europe, maybe there's some differences in Spain versus France versus the United Kingdom. So understanding that and knowing that you need to be flexible in how you structure a channel for a given country. And so I guess the, 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 the key issue here is there is no one size fits all solution when it comes to creating any kind of channel, but it's even more important when we're talking about trying to sell products through uh, international channels and having uh, various cultures that might be vastly different. So we want to obviously select the channel members and then we have some sort of management system, something that makes them accountable, um, provide some sort of uh, motivation through some sort of reward system. Also too in there, there really should be something that, that, that connects to you know punishment. So if they're not doing their job, you have to figure out how can you at least contractually protect yourselves. So if there is a a uh, contracted amount of personal selling that needs to be done uh, within the retail channel and they're not performing that role, you want to make sure you have some sort of recourse. Um, personally, I would probably say if you think personal selling is going to be the way to go, you should have enough control within your contract and your channel to say, I'm going to put the people in there who can actually sell my product. But once you find a way to motivate them, reward them, and if they don't do well, you got to find a way to make sure that they know they're not doing well. But at the end of the day, you have to have some kind of evaluation process. And you have to be able to evaluate them um, on whatever time frame seems reasonable. Maybe it's more intense if you have a seasonal kind of product where when it comes upon you know, your, your high season, um, you need to have some metrics in place where you can tell whether or not channel members are performing their roles uh, and not wait for two or three months after things kind of get out of control. Now, there are, there are different types of uh, examples of policies that relate more so to the, the distribution and the exclusivity related to distribution. So typically, when we talk about something that's an exclusive distribution, it's when and the seller only allows certain outlets to carry its product. Um, so for example, uh, you may find that you have a premium brand product and you only want to have it sold in an area where you can actually physically have somebody sell it. So, for example, certain perfumes and colognes, uh, they love being in the, that, the bright lights of a Macy's or a Nordstrom's where all the, the colognes are. I call it Cologne City. And you walk into that environment, that's an ideal way to, to sell that product. You can demonstrate it. People can actually smell it. Um, and if we're talking about makeup, it could be demonstrated by having um, the... Um, salespeople provide makeovers and, and makeup tips to, to the women who go through there. Um, and in a lot of ways, then you'd say, okay, does it make sense? Should it only be within all the Macy's that might be on the Eastern Seaboard? Or do we want to sell it in, in Macy's and Bloomingdale's and all the others? But exclusive distribution generally means it's going to be just one select group of stores. Also, too, you may have sellers oftentimes who will say that if you carry our brand, you can't carry our competitors' brands. Now, keep in mind, 
any anytime you are requesting exclusivity, the price goes up. And so the margins have to be there for the retailer for that to actually make sense. So let's say you sell a, 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 a bottle of cologne at the retail level for, oh, let's say it's $100. And the wholesale price that's sold to the retailer might be $50. If you want an exclusive type of relationship or arrangement, you might have to actually sell it to that retailer for maybe 45 giving them some incentive to not carry some of your competitors' products. They also have some of these exclusive territorial agreements where the producers or the sellers limit the, the actual territory that they're actually in. Uh, you see this a lot in franchising. Um, so if somebody owns a McDonald's, typically if you see another McDonald's that's win within driving distance or in an urban area, a short walking distance, it's probably owned by the same franchisee. And so you don't have two competing franchises who are down the street or almost next door to one another. And so the, the, the last one, um, these tying agreements or, or agreements where the dealer must take most or all of the line. And basically it says, if you want our marquee or our high-end product, you're gonna have to also um, take, and it kind of ties into some of the bundling stuff that we were talking about earlier. Uh, in another video, where basically if you want HBO, you want somebody to sell HBO for you, they also have to carry Cinemax, and I think it's Stars is the other one they, they actually show. So if you want to distribute that on your, your system, which is HBO is a strong drawer, draw for them, you have to really make sure that you, you um, take every single thing else that they actually sell. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit into logistics. Now, I, I mean, I will be honest, logistics is probably not the most exciting thing that, that, that marketers get involved with. But again, it's a reality. It's the physical distribution of what it is that, that goes into getting the product from the people who make the stuff to the people who buy the stuff. And so it's really, really important when we're talking about products that need to be hauled over long distances. They have to be hauled in containers that protect them through refrigeration, potentially. Uh, automobiles have to be protected uh, not only from the elements, but also, too, from some of the, you know, the physical dangers that you might have in, in actually transporting uh, automobile, especially for very, very high-end types of vehicles. Um, you typically those things are uh, Ferraris or some of the others are actually shipped in large tractor trailers, not on those very, very large barges, I call them, where you might have 20 different automobiles stacked uh, and then pulled along throughout the highway. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we, I mean, it involves a very, very complicated planning process. Again, it's elements of time, it's elements of risk. All these things need to be taken into account to make sure that you get the product that you sell and, and, and manufacture to the ultimate consumer in the best form possible. And that, that means free of damage and defects um, that will hopefully allow you to sell it and then have to buy um, more in terms of repeat purchasing. So supply chain and, and logistics are, are, again, very, very important uh, parts of getting it. Again, we're trying to see how can we get products to our end customers. And so these logistical uh, trails that we see here, just like the supply chain, uh, they have to add some value. For example, here, these folks here, in terms of these uh, logistical companies that might get it from the suppliers to, to your particular company, uh, it, it might be something uh, where there is a speed element that allows them to get it to the company in a, in a, in a quick way. Um, these outbound types of logistical companies, they might provide some kind of service that will get the end product to the reseller in a way that, that not only will be fast, but maybe it's, it has to be more safe and secure depending on the product, uh, again, that we're actually selling. Many business schools today have a major, uh, definitely at the graduate level, but also too maybe at the undergraduate level where they talk about supply chain management. And so here when we think about supply chain management, we're talking about managing the process uh, products as well as information up and downstream. 
Uh, remember, we were talking about up and downstream. We were talking about the difference between the raw materials that you require, and that's very different compared to um, downstream where we're talking about getting the products into the hands of the consumers through retail uh, generally. Uh, so for that, it, it's really thinking about them almost as two separate businesses that you have. And understanding the relationships with those partners are varied as well. Retailers have a great understanding about end customers and end users. Whereas when we talk about people who sell manufacturing parts, they're more of a business to business company and they know a lot about businesses who manufacture products that use their raw materials. And typically they'll provide, you know, different types of functions, warehousing, transportation, inventory management. So when you get to the point where you're running low on spark plugs, a lot of these systems are integrated, technologically speaking. And if you need to have a reorder, that's something you don't have to worry about. So the logistics system will allow you to, to link systems together where you hit a critical low in terms of spark plugs or in terms of uh, leather or whatever the component part is at the automobile, ma automobile manufacturer, and it automatically triggers an order um, and hopefully at the best price. And also logistics information. You can, most uh, organizations can track shipments today uh, online uh, with some sort of uh, chip that might be embedded into the, the carton that they're actually packed in. They can find out exactly where their order is in the supply chain physically. They could tell you what container it's on, what ship it's on, the estimated time for it to arrive at the dock. And so logistically speaking, you can do a lot better where you can actually pick it up and deliver it back to your warehouse to incorporate it into uh, the product that you're actually manufacturing. So technology just allows you to, in a, in a logistic sense, um, to transport as well as to deliver uh, products as well as component parts in a way that's efficient and, and cost effective. Now, warehousing is, is you know, again, not a very sexy kind of thing, but uh, again, you have to physically have a place to hold the product before it's actually shipped. In an ideal world, we as consumers would walk into the manufacturer's plant and we'd back up our truck to pick up our TV, but that's just not the way it works. These facilities typically at these warehouses or the manufacturing plants are in very remote places where the cost of real estate is significantly lower. Um, and that, that's why they have warehouses in remote places because it is cheaper. Um, but the question you have to ask yourself when it comes to deciding on warehousing, you have to decide how many you need, where should they be located? And, and, and if we're thinking about these things, it always has to revolve around the customer. So how is it going to help us to have physical locations in certain cities? Depends on where our customers are. Uh, Amazon, for example, have will have warehouses all around the country. So if you've ever placed an order with Amazon, you let's say you placed an order for two books, a CD, and then maybe a watch. It is possible that you might receive those in two shipments, usually no more than two shipments. And you might find the book and the CD, and especially if you're doing a prime service or some of the others where they kind of guarantee you get it in two days. And so they'll, they'll send it to you and logistically they will find the item that you purchased in the physical geographic area that is as close as they can possibly get to your delivery site. And so what that means is that it gives them an opportunity to uh, stick to that promise that they've made in terms of the delivery time. And so it might make sense to give you that CD from, let's say you live in Washington, D.C. And they have a, a plant in or a warehouse in Virginia. So it will come from Virginia. It will get to your house a lot quicker than if they took it from another city somewhere west of uh, Washington, D.C., let's say Cleveland or the Ohio area. The point there is they have all the warehouses located strategically so they can best serve their customers in a more time efficient manner. A couple of concepts that I, that I think are, are really important to understand. Just-in-time systems generally 
are the ones where, for example, raw materials are delivered just in time for them to be embedded into the products that are being manufactured. So if you happen to work for a Hewlett Packard computer, the Dell chips or the AMD chips or the video cards or the RAM that you buy from, from outside suppliers, you only order them so they can be delivered just in time for you to actually manufacture your run of uh, desktops or laptops. Um, the reason you do that is because you just want to make sure that you don't have a bunch of computers just uh, sitting around or a bunch of component parts just sitting around waiting to be integrated into a final product. It wastes time. It, it ties up resources physically in terms of space, but also to money as well. Um, things like RFID chips, I think I mentioned that with regard to uh, shipments. Great way to keep track of products in terms of where they are in, in the delivery process. A great way to get to this just-in-time system where you can pretty much know whether or not something's off track in terms of the timing of the delivery. And these smart shelves, uh, too, are the ones I was talking about before where, you know, if you run out of a certain supply, it could be a raw material, it could be a retail store. Uh, when you run out of something, it'll automatically trigger an order. And so you can get the item just in time. And here are some of the, the major functions that you'll have, you know, uh, within an organization that is logistics based. Um, obviously, there are many ways that you can actually ship or transport a product. Uh, truck, rail, water, pipeline, air, Internet. The, the key point here is if it is a product that is very, very large and you're shipping large quantities of them, chances are rail and or water would probably be more important or most appropriate. Uh, trucks, no matter how large they are, they're never going to be as large as a, a, a rail car that might, or rail cars or a train that might have 15, 20, 30 cars long or a big shipping tanker. Um, those are all going to be used and also too it depends on where it's coming from. So something overseas, it might make sense to put it on the water if it's not imperative to get there very quickly. If it is imperative for it to get there very quickly, maybe shipping it via air might be the most important. Obviously, digital products, um, anything that can be done through technology, the internet is always a great solution uh, these days. And for the most part, still extremely cost effective. Now, the concept of, of inventory management, information management when it comes to logistics, this is all about trying to understand the, the flow of information, where the orders are, the billing process. Sometimes people lose money by not sending their bills out on time. You can't expect people to pay for orders that you shipped unless you actually send them a bill. That's usually what triggers a check to be written. Uh, it helps to manage inventory levels. It tells you a lot more about what's going on with customers through a lot of the data collection. Uh, so again, the important point here is that logistically speaking, there are many roles that logistics play. It's just a matter of having some kind of system where you can measure the effectiveness of, of how things are actually running. I think I already alluded to this integrated uh, logistics management system where companies literally come together using their technologies to enable them to essentially talk and speak to one another by integrating their systems and networks together. It just makes it a lot easier to place a reorder um, or to make people aware that there are defects in some of the shipments that were, were sent out last month. Um, so technology again, here we are using technology uh, to better make things work um, across organizations. And lastly, there are some companies that are, are great that outsource any of these rail companies or these trucking companies. Oftentimes, there are um, companies who uh, can't afford to have a staff of um, drivers to drive across country and, and deliver product. They can't afford it. They don't want to have the overhead. They can't afford um, dealing with the labor unions in terms of pensions and health care benefits. And so for them, it just makes sense to outsource it. And so, of course, outsourcing, there's never a shortage of outsourced companies. Um, Amazon has pretty much 
almost revived UPS in terms of using them as an outsourced delivery service and also some logistics stuff too. Um, but always keep in mind, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. You have to find the most efficient and effective way to do what you need to do to deliver your products on time uh, to your customers. Okay, anyway, that is the end of chapter 12. And the next module will be chapter 13, where we talk about retail very specifically as part of the uh, channels of marketing. That was easy. See you on the other side.